Sure. There we go. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Manhattan Community Board 3's Health Seniors Human Services Youth Education and Human Rights Committee meeting. Uh, this is the uh, March monthly meeting. My name is May Lee and I am the chair. Okay, so today's, okay, so before I uh, go talk more about the agenda, Larissa Shaneberg, our Zoom facilitator, will explain the procedures of the meeting. Larissa. Thank you, May. As you've noticed, our meeting is being recorded. Um, we ask that our chat this evening be used for two purposes. That will be for roll call and for technical assistance only. Um, if you are from, if you are a non-board member, we ask that you please put your name and your affiliation, if that is appropriate, in the chat box so that we can have attendance. Um, if you are experiencing any technical difficulty, for example, if you cannot take yourself off mute or having trouble uh, hearing or connecting, just drop a message in the chat and I'll reach out to you to help you resolve it. Um, during the meeting, we ask that you remain on mute when you are not acknowledged to speak by the chair to reduce background noise. Uh, during the course of the meeting, our chair, May, will be calling on the members of the board first, or the committee first, and then members of the public for questions. If you would like to have uh, your, if you would like to ask question, please raise your hand, your virtual hand um, on Zoom. We, I will also keep an eye out for physical hands being raised just in case you're having issues and we will call on you in order. Thank you and welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Larissa. Okay, I just, uh, just one slight correction and I don't think we have any such people here, but if you are not a member of the committee, but a member of the board, you should still sign the chat. Oh, uh, you know, put your name in the chat. Okay, so we'll start the meeting. Um, today's uh, agenda will include um, a presentation from Hamilton Madison House and also Henry Street Settlement. Uh, they operate a Connect uh, mental health program. It's a new program and they'll be talking about what it is and, you know, and the program and what they're doing. Uh, after we'll have questions and answers um, from the you know from everyone who's attending the meeting afterwards, but we'll hear from them first. Okay. Uh, the second agenda item will be a presentation from NYU Langone about their program for um, uh, uh, home care, you know, uh, for people doing home care. So they um, not mentioned it a little bit at full board, but they'll just give a little bit more of a presentation at this meeting, and we'll also get to ask questions. Uh, so before we uh, start the uh, presentations and agenda items, we will have roll call and approval of the minutes. Thomas. Okay, thanks, May. Um, ready for our roll call, May Lee. Here. Thomas Rosa, here. Larissa. Present. Anna. Anna Calderon. Um, Eric, Eric Diaz. Yeah. All yeah. right, thank you. Larry Fenn. Present. Thank you. Shirley Fennessy. Shirley, are you with us? Deborah. Deborah Jeffrey Glass. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Alicia Lewis Coleman. Alicia? Heidi? Heidi Schmidt? Arnett? Present. Thank you. Rodney? Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. And Carmen Perez? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, now, as for approval of the minutes, I emailed it out, the February minutes out to you, to all committee members. It was actually in the third email, not the first one. Uh, if you have any changes or additions, uh, please raise your hand and let me know. Okay. Uh, what? I'll, I'll wait till you finish the minutes. I'm looking for that. 
Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So uh, the minutes are approved. Oh, Susan. Okay, so the person is here for that quick announcement on the um, lung donation. It's Ashley. Oh, there's the lung. Okay, there's the lung. Okay, lung donations. Okay. I was thinking of the workshop, but. No, I think it was workshop. a donation. No, oh, I thought it was a webinar. Okay, Ashley, did you want to make an announcement? Uh, yes, um, I just have like one to two slides. Is that okay if I pull it up? Or I can do a quick announcement anyways. <laughs> We should probably just go ahead with the announcement. Oh, sure. I'll just I'll just go ahead with the announcement. Um. So, OK, so hi, hi everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Community Board 3, for letting me have a quick word today. Uh, my name is Ashley. I'm a nurse and also a researcher working on this new lung donation study. So we're currently working with communities of New York City to increase opportunities for lung donation. We would like to engage the diverse communities that will be impacted by our study, especially the communities around Bellevue Hospital area. Um, so we're looking for interested community com uh, community members to join this discussion. Um, so we're hosting focus groups, 90 minute focus groups online, and we will be presenting our study protocol and asking for feedback or address any comments that they may have. And every person gets a $50 Amazon gift card. So if you're interested, please, please contact me. Um, I, um, Susan has my contact information and we're hoping to get on the April schedule so that we can um, do a detailed presentation and educate the public and the, all the communities about lung donation and um, our study. So that's if, you, if, if you put your contact information in the chat, everyone okay. can get it. Great, I will put it in there. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank so you. So are you saying by April you will have finished your study or done all your, your uh, focus no. group? No, no, we are um, still in the recruiting phase. So we're doing focus groups with different um, communities and uh, different groups of doctors and nurses. So we're doing um, these focus groups with different stakeholders that will be impacted by our long donation protocol. So um, we're it's still ongoing. It's 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 the duration is two years, but right. we're hoping to get community feedback by the end of this year. That way we can improve our protocol and the protocol will probably be implemented in 2024. Okay, thank you very much, Ashley. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, so okay, so we'll move on to our first agenda, main agenda item, which is the Connect program. We have two speakers. Uh, there is, um, I'm sorry, Rebecca. There's, can you just introduce your numbers? Because the names are very small and I can't see them. So if ha Henry Street and Hamilton Madison can introduce yourselves, um, you can start talking. Um, it's one at a time. So, because I know your programs are uh, not exactly the same. Uh, do, do you have a, a preference as to who should go first? Um, I, two of you? No. Uh, Lainey, do you want to go first? <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I can just okay. first. Okay, so please uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Lainey Perez. Um, I'm the community liaison for a Connect program over at Henry Street Settlement. I'm filling in for Whitney Carlson today, and I do want to thank all of you for having me here today. Um, so Connect is a it's a new pilot um, program that recently launched in January of 2022 um, within the Health and Wellness Division at Henry Street Settlement. So um, it's really to rethink how mental health services are delivered to community uh, members and clinic, it's a clinic without walls approach. Um, basically it will allow people to access mental health services faster and in a manner, um, way, um, which it's included with, um, psychotherapy, medication management, um, recovery support and other support. So we people where, where they're at. Um, we do have a team of four um, clinicians that work in, um, in the field and in the clinic. Um, this program was 
funded by the mayor's office um, for about three years to focus on four different populations, which is the homeless population, um, people that is struggling with substance use, severe mental illness, and involved with any criminal justice. Um, so at this time, um, we continue to develop the program as we go with community feedback and um, continuing the engagement with the community and um, the clinic. So that is um, part of CONNECT. And CONNECT is an acronym. So it means um, community engagement between community clinic and um, treatment. I guess it's my turn. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for um, letting us have the space to speak to you all. Uh, my name is Fanny. I'm the program director for the Hamilton Madison House Connect program. Um, the basis of our Connect program is essentially the same as what Lainey explained. Um, we uh, currently serve anyone in, who is a resident of the Lower East Side um, in Chinatown area who's over 18 years of age. They, um, the only requirements that we have is that they live in the area and they have an existing mental health diagnosis or are willing to be evaluated by our team. Um, we currently have a team of um, one dedicated clinician for psychotherapy purposes and one psychiatrist who recently joined us. We have a registered nurse who can um, assist with health and wellness as well as medication administering. Um, and we also have a case manager on staff. So we do also try to provide wraparound services, um, but we are focused on bringing mental health care to individuals who you know, traditionally would not be able to access um, you know, appropriate mental health care. We are um, technically considered a, a higher level of care than the traditional outpatient clinic, um, mostly so that we can try to bring everyone um, in the community to sort of a level where they can access traditional um, therapy services in, in our clinic rather than having us go to their homes all the time. So we'll start by doing home visits, community visits, whatever, you know, whatever they're more comfortable with, but the end goal is to have them come into the clinic where they can um, receive all their services. And we are able to assist with um, any mental health concerns. We are able to refer people directly to our substance use clinic that is also part of Hamilton Madison House. We're in the same building. So if we do end up referring anybody, we can just walk them down, do a, do a, a warm handoff. Um, and we also can work with anyone uh, who are uh, any individuals who are street homeless, but who happen to just be in the Lower East Side area frequently. The main thing is we want to be able to, you know, be in contact with them on a consistent basis so that we can get them connected to services. Um, yeah, so that's essentially what we can do. Um, if you need to reach us, uh, our email, I'll actually put our email in the, um, in the chat as well. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know, you, you know, the program is new and I think we also, you know, want to hear more about your experiences and your results, you know, or, you know, you know any challenges or any successes. Um, I also wanted to note we're joined by, um, by Vera, Vera Lee from Grace Lee's office, Assembly Member Lee's office, and also Julio Rivas from Council member, you know, uh, from Carlina Rivera's office. So, um, you know, there are, uh, so they are our state elected officials, or city and state. So they may also um, want to know, you know, uh, more about your program and how they can help. E, so we could start with questions and answers, if, or I don't know if you have any more to say. Um, I'm ready to answer any questions that um, anyone might have about the program. Okay, so um, committee members, raise your hands. Larissa Chainberg. Hi, okay, thank you for acknowledging me. 
Um, so this message is for Hamilton Madison. Thank, first of all, thank you for the presentation. This is a wonderful program. Uh, mental health has been sorely needed uh, to be highlighted, especially after a pandemic, and I applaud your program. Um, first of all, how long has the program been in, um, in it has been active at Hamilton Madison? Um, and Oh, Apple, go ahead and I'll ask the next question, sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, technically the contract has been active since January, mm -hmm. but um, we have been trying to uh, sort of hire on staff um, for, I think, the duration of the last year. Um, I actually joined the team in September. Um, prior to that, I believe um, we had only um, gotten enough staff to actually start providing services in uh, April of 2022. So I would say we, um, we've been uh, active since then. Okay, wonderful. And that, so you led into my next question was about staffing. Um, do you feel that you'll be able to sufficiently staff uh, the program to meet the needs of the clientele who will be coming in? And if not, would you be able to refer out to other facilities that you have a, a relationship with? Um, we are still in the process of hiring staff. Um, that has been our biggest challenge so far um, because we are getting um, a, a big influx of referrals from, um, you know, multiple resources. Um, but if we cannot provide, um, you know, enough uh, help to any referrals that we get, we do refer them out. And do you know, where do you uh, refer out to? Are there- uh, it, uh, Yeah, there it depends on the needs. It depends on the needs of the person. Um, if they are looking for primarily um, case management services, it also depends on the language that they speak. Um, we we serve a lot of uh, clients from the community who, um, who speak Chinese or, um, you know, they need services in that language. In those cases, uh, we do look for resources in the Chinatown area. Uh, most recently, I um, I had referred somebody to CPC for um, you know just case management assistance. Um, if it's um, someone who needs more severe um, you know substance use assistance, like they need to go to inpatient or they need to go to residential, there are a number of places that we can refer to. Um, it can be either in Queens, upstate, wherever the client wants to go. <laughs> There's even, uh, we could even send them to the nearest hospital if it's really an emergency where they need detox services or even local um, places in the city. Um, if it's a mental health service that we cannot um, accommodate, we will uh, provide the referral source with options. Um, I, I recently had to uh, turn someone away, unfortunately, who um, had a eating disorder as their primary diagnosis, and we cannot accommodate that at this time, but we did um, send their psychiatrist, like they have an existing psychiatrist, so we did send them um, various options, um, like outside of the Lower East Side area. So uh, okay. we, we do try our best to accommodate. Thank you so much, Manny. Okay, uh, Larissa, was, uh, was your only question? For now. <laughs> And okay. have to uh, okay. a little later. I want to give everyone a chance. Okay. Um, so next is Eric Diaz, followed by Susan Statzer. Hi. Um, question for, I guess, both service providers uh, regarding um, the, the, the clients that you are, are receiving. Uh, what would you say? Are they mostly people? Um, are they mostly homeless folks? Are they mostly... Do they see? Do you see them coming, uh, maybe by and large, from public housing? Where would you see sort of, I guess, the greater uh, uh, upticks or, or the common trends of of clients seeking mental health services from what you guys have seen on the field? Um, at least on on Hamilton Madison House's side, we are getting a lot of referrals from inpatient uh, hospital settings. We um, are also getting clients who are on wait lists for um, assertive community treatment or, and other uh, single point of access services. And we do get some referrals from uh, the local NORC communities. Um, we are also getting some walk-ins as well. Um, as for 
homeless populations. Um, we're not getting so many of those types of walk-ins, but we are um, reaching out to other providers in the community um, and local shelters for outreach purposes. Last question, a follow-up on that. And if Henry Street wants to jump in, by all means, to answer that question. I can answer. Hi, I'm so sorry, Emily. Um, I'm Whitney Colson. I'm the director of the Connect program at the Henry Street Settlement. Um, sorry, between getting off the phone for another reason and settling my children at the table, I'm a little late tonight, so I do apologize. Um, oh, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, that Lainey has not provided that information for. Um, I would say we have a solid mix of folks who are either experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity, and then folks from um, the local community as far as NYCHA buildings and kind of a mix within the community. Um, but we do have a significant amount of individuals within our program um, that are either, you know, within the shelter system or experiencing housing insecurity and either have been recently or are, are kind of on the verge of entering the shelter system. Thanks. And and, and then my last follow-up question to that, would you, are, are we experiencing uh, referrals from uh, residents and, and clients from outside our, our community, um, more so than our community? Um, I'm just wondering, um, since you have uh, take referrals from like clinics and hospitals, I'm just curious to know um, if you're noticing a uh, that because the need is so great citywide, are you is, is a, a good amount of your caseload outside of the media community, um, or would you say the caseload is majority within uh, the CB3 community? Um, and I ask because I sit on the Gouverneur uh, Advisory Board, and we do notice that Gouverneur is so effective and so sought after in, in many of its services that will, you know it often there's there's a lot of uh, a demand from coming outside the community, so there's always um, I guess that that tug and pull, you know, uh, for the immediate. So that that's my question uh, to you all, to you both. Yes, we do get um, referrals from outside of our community and our catchment area, um, and unfortunately, like we just have to take them on a case by case basis. Um, one of the reasons why uh, we get at least our site gets a lot of referrals from. Uh, clients who live outside of our catchment areas because of the language necessities. So we do try to accommodate those as well. Um, like we can work with them if they're able to come to the office for services, but we cannot go to their homes in those cases. So, so you would say the majority is, is really with, within the com immediate community? Okay. Yes. So, I'm not sure if it's different for Henry Street. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I, I'm not entirely sure what, if anything, Lainey's provided about our program. Um, I caught kind of the tail end of um, what was Fanny was saying. Hi, Fanny. It's nice to see you. Um, but as far as the way that our program operates, we um, operate out of Henry Street's kind of outpatient program building. Um, and anybody from outside of the specific kind of lower east side catchment area actually has to go through our outpatient program. Um, and then essentially, if my team can't walk there or take a quick bus ride, we don't service them. Um, so we have four full-time clinicians. I also see clients myself. And every single one of those clients is from um, the local community. Um, and then we also have a tremendous offering of groups. And those are local, um, open to the community and larger. But the majority, I would say, at least 90% of those folks are from the community. Thank you both for the work you're doing. Okay, um, next we have Susan Stetzer followed by, I'm sorry, followed by Julio Rivas. Okay, so, uh, so first of all, and thank you, thank you for coming. I, you know, asked everyone to come and we, you know, we have had uh, quite a few conversations to um, try to get up to speed on this. First of all, for referrals from the shelter system, Will the new city council bill that is going to require mental health in every shelter, will that impact referrals to your two programs? Or do you expect, I should ask, do you expect it to? Um, we currently are operating in a universe where every time I hire a clinician, their caseload is full within three weeks. Um, so I'm not overly concerned about any changes. And if anything, adding mental health staff to the shelter communities that will help us with coordination and, and that type of thing. Um, but as far as impacting it, if, if anything, it'll kind of lower our numbers and that's not a bad thing. 
Um, we do have a tremendous amount of walk-in um, and people coming walking into our doors every day. Um, I think out of all the connect clinics, we actually have the highest number of walk-ins. Um, and it's to the point that I have been hiring staff as fast as I possibly can. Um, and actually spoke to um, kind of our representative at the at the program level to see if we can add more staff for that reason. Um, so it's if we can staff it, the caseloads will be full and the need is there. So that's kind of our take on it. And just to confirm with Street Homeless, it sounded like, um, I don't know if both of your programs do this, but it sounded like Fanny mentioned it and possibly that you do um, do connect with people on the street and the goal is to encourage them to get them into the clinic. Is that is that tr true? Um, so our doors are open as far as, as individuals coming in. We also offer services in the community. Um, at this time, my team cannot staff outreach because of the amount of people coming into our program um, kind of on their own accord. Um, but we will see individuals in the community. We will see them in a park if that's what, where they're most comfortable. We'll take them out for lunch. We will offer them a shower. We will do just about anything we can as far as meeting their mental health needs. Um, but at this time, we are not actively doing outreach just because I don't have the staff to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. We have a full caseload of at least 100 clients that we brought in in the last year already. And then on top of that is our group members, which is probably another 150 people. No, I understand that we, we need to get you double your size and give you more money per person. Uh, sure, I, I get more it. money would help, absolutely. <laughs> um, and Fanny, do you wanna yes. talk at all? Are you, and are you going to um, the SDR pop up at all um, on Thursdays? Yes, uh, we're actually planning on going there um, for a tour on the 23rd. And Great. as for street outreach, um, we're still not really able to do that similar situation to uh, Henry Street, but um, that is hopefully going to be in the plans once we're fully staffed. Okay. Um, and for the referrals, um, is there usually a pretty long wait time? Um, no, it, the turnaround time is about um, a week for us to actually get somebody to see the person, um, unless the hospital is, is delaying the discharge, but if it's someone in the community, we can usually see them within a week. That's great. Thank you. Our turnaround is, um, we have walk-ins. Um, we've actually had to limit the days, but previous to this week, we had walk-ins every day, nine to, uh, nine to one, which meant people would be seen immediately um, because of kind of where we are as far as case lives, we've had to kind of whittle that down to Wednesdays. Um, but anybody that walks in the door will be seen same day. Um, and then obviously if there is an emergent situation, we'll make sure that the turnaround is extremely quickly. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Julio Rivas followed by Carmen Perez. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Julio Rivas. I'm the community board three liaison for council member. Carolina Rivera's office. Thank you so much for CB3 for putting this together um, and Fanny and Whitney for coming today. Um, I know Fanny mentioned earlier that there's no requirements for the folks, the individuals that they treat. Uh, Whitney, can you also answer that? Do you have requirements uh, in regards to homelessness, drug use, or any other sort of thing? No, as of right now, um, we have very loose parameters um 18 and plus 18 and up is one the, like the hardest line they have to be an adult um as far as um the other areas as far as like substance use etc um if it, it's a very weird kind of designation if their primary need is substance use and they'd be better served in a substance use program and they're willing to accept substance use assistance we would make a referral to that <laughs> level there are a lot of people who are just not there yet um, and as long as it will not kind of deter from other goals or, you know, various things, we will, you know, essentially accept them. Um, we do so, see folks regardless of insurance, stat, you know, status, documentation, language capacity, we have pretty kind of full roster. So we do everything we can to see as many people as we can. Great. If they don't want the, the service, the, to a drug use service facility, do you guys still assist with drug use? And Fanny, if you could also answer that question as well. 
Yes, we absolutely do. We have a substance recovery um, peer on staff who essentially would work with those individuals right. on kind of their level of readiness for change and uh, recognizing, you know, the concern that we would have clinically um, with working with someone if, with that ongoing issue. Um, but our, our program tries to keep our kind of parameters as open as possible. Yeah, we are right. also. Uh, we're also open to working with anybody, um, regardless of where they are in their recovery process, and we always keep the door open if they ever change their mind, or, um, and we always provide as much information as we can to our clients. Yeah, um, and then just one more question. You guys are saying you guys are having a lot of walk-ins and folks who are coming on their own accord. Do you guys see a trend with these individuals, like what makes them come in uh, uh, into, like on their own accord, whereas others don't. I'm just curious about that. As of right now, we, we don't have a lot of walk-ins. Um, I think that's the oh, okay. main difference between um, uh, the, Ma Hamilton, the Hamilton Madison House site and the Henry Street site. I think you guys get a lot more walk-ins than us. Yeah, it's, it's been busy. Yeah. Um, we do see a tremendous amount of walk-ins. Um, I think a week ago, Wednesday, we had seven in a day, uh, which is a lot when you consider that a full intake is about two hours. Um, but as far as pattern or trend, the thing I noticed the most is most of these people have been on wait lists in other places and been seeking help for months. Mm -hmm. And then they find out that we don't Got have it. a wait list and that we are actively seeing people and that we're not just seeing people via telehealth. There are a lot of people who have been told we can only see you a phone call. We've only been, you know, see you through a screen. And then when people find out that we actually will sit with them face to face um, and then Got it. more to that, they come in. All right. All right. Thank you. That's it for me for now. Okay. Um, Carmen Perez followed by Elizabeth Hyde. Uh, hi, and good evening. Um, with the um, Connect program, uh, what would you say your percentages are seniors? Um, I don't have an exact percentage um, to give you right this second, but um, I will say that in the past month, our um, amount of senior referrals um, have actually gone up since we um, reached out to the local NORC communities. Um, I would say I have two intakes coming up in the next week uh, for referrals who are above uh, 80 years old and above. So mm -hmm. I can give that <laughs> number. Okay, then that um, brings me to my second question. I know that um, when I last spoke to Henry Street, uh, this was prior to the pandemic, uh, they introduced to us a PEARLS program, um, program to encourage active rewarding lives. Just wanted to know if um, that was still ongoing or. Yes. Okay. So I was, I was, you know, as far as our answer, um, we have four programs that actively serve the needs of, of seniors as far as mental health. Um, our outpatient program does. We have a um, kind of a senior satellite program as well that does home and community visits. We have our Pearls program, uh, which you just described, and then we also see seniors. I believe, and please don't quote me on this, the last time I ran our data, it was 19% of folks over the age of 65 um, were our kind of connect status um, stats. Um, and I think the reason that we kind of see that number is because we do have other options, but there are only two of our programs that will see people within the community or in their home. And that's our program in Pearls. Um, and then the CASA program, the, the satellite program also can, um, but we generally will get those folks who are a little bit more homebound or, you know, experiencing kind of fear of isolation and, and going into the community. And that, those are the individuals we generally see. All right. Because I'm just from observation alone, post pandemic, I'm pretty sure that the numbers have risen because we've seen that in our area. So I'm just <laughs> glad to know that these programs are still around. <laughs> Carmen, um, you should... You should describe what you do. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I run the neighborhood north for Cooper Square Community 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 uh, Cooper Square Committee, <laughs> and so um, our catchment area. Hmm, sorry, is all of the East Village. Okay. All right. Um, Carmen, did you have anything else? No, that was it. I just wanted to make sure that um, you know these programs were, were still available because we still get people who come in uh, often enough asking for them 
or children asking for their parents because we've seen a lot of um, cognitive decline. Okay. Uh, next is Elizabeth Hyde. Hi, uh, yes, thank you for having me. I should probably just introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Hyde. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of um, SPOA Treatment and Care Coordination at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And we, the CONNECT programs are in our portfolio of programs. Uh, so we hold the contract uh, with them as the uh, local government unit and um, oversee uh, the services from that end. And so I just wanted to, uh, uh, I guess, pipe in with a couple of additional thoughts and some of the questions that folks had. Um, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to, to clarify that for um, the Connect programs, uh, they were selected specifically for the neighborhoods that they lived in. So we selected them because they're what um, we call a tree neighborhoods, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but um, Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity um, with uh, the mayor's office identified certain neighborhoods that were most impacted by mental health concerns, homelessness, poverty, um, uh, a variety of issues. And so we chose clinics that were specifically in those neighborhoods. And so obviously, um, as you can tell, the Lower East Side was one of those neighborhoods. And part of our contracts with these connect clinics is that um, primarily they are to serve their community members. Um, so I know that question came up. Um, you know, it's uh, strongly, strongly encouraged that um, the programs are specifically seeing people um, in and around the zip codes that the, that the clinics are in. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. Um, I also wanted to just clarify um, a couple of the, the priorities. So, so all of the Connect clinics, um, have certain what we call priority populations uh, that we um, say if they're referred, they should move to the top of your list in, in terms of who to see. Um, and those are individuals who are homeless. Those are individuals who have had um, recent criminal justice involvement. So either they are about to come out of Rikers Island or they have recently come out of Rikers Island um, uh, in general. Um, and then sort of what we call step downs, which is um, uh, people who are in our highest level of service that are ready to, to try something not as intensive, but need more than just a clinic can provide. Um, we're trying to also free up some of our slots, our, our, our vacancies in, in our um, highest levels of service, because obviously there's just, there's a huge need in this city. Um, uh, for with people with very complex needs. I also wanted to um, just clarify that all of the Connect clinics are um, required to provide what's called medication assisted treatment. Um, and so that's uh, where a prescriber is able to uh, prescribe medications um, specific for addressing substance misuse. So whether that be alcohol, whether that be opiates, um, things like that. Um, and then I just wanted to say the challenges I, I have I have so much respect uh, for the Connect clinics and, and all mental health providers in the city, but the workforce challenge, I know you guys know, is, is just an incredible um, struggle. Uh, the mental health uh, field has been in, incredibly hit. Um, I know they have been working extremely hard to try and staff up um, so that they could take uh, as many referrals as, as humanly possible, but, you know, it, it's, like everything in the city, um, it's been a, a very difficult time. I um, mean, then the last thing I just wanted to clarify was regarding outreach. So one of the things that we're most, we're most proud of and most insistent on with our Connect Clinics is what we call outreach. And I just wanted to clarify that for, for us, when we're talking about outreach, we're not talking about canvassing the, the streets. We're talking about um, providing that extra level of service to people who are already enrolled in their clinic. So one of the problems um, that that often happens when people are enrolled in clinics is they miss an appointment and then they get they get discharged um, and without really any outreach or follow up. So when we're saying outreach, we're talking about phone calls. We're talking about physically someone going to the person's home to find out what is going on that you stopped attending your appointments. Um, that's a level of 
um, intensive engagement um, that clinics don't generally offer. It's also one of the reasons why the connect clinics have to stay so sort of within their zip code and community because that's that's a lot of time for for people to to be going out to to people's homes. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to give that additional information and um, thank you all for having me. I'm sorry, Elizabeth. I just want since you're here, I just want to clarify when you said outreach to clinics, like for example, people who may be missing their appointments. Did you mean? the connect clinics at those agencies or you mean other clinics elsewhere? So other clinics elsewhere do not do any field, what we call field visits, visits to people's homes. They, they don't, they don't get okay. reimbursed for it by, by health insurance. And so, mm -hmm. and it's costly. And so they don't do it. And so part of our funding is to allow these connect clinics to provide that service. But yes, that is, that is really a service that's only provided by these connect clinics to the other clinic? I mean, to the patients of another clinic? Oh no, to the patients of the Connect clinic? Yes. Okay. Okay, I, I was, because um, I, you know, heard Fanny also saying they were getting referrals from other yeah. providers. Yeah. Y yes, yes. I mean, people get referred to the Connect mm -hmm. clinic from a, a variety of resources, but you know, when, when someone's enrolled in the Connect clinic, then if they start to fall, kind of what we call fall out of care, they stop attending appointments or start being really symptomatic in a way that's really concerning, um, then these home visits um, can be done. Um, but again, it's, it's generally for the, for the folks that are enrolled in the clinic. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have some more hands raised. Um, I don't want to take, take so much time. I'm going to choose someone who has not spoken yet. So that will be Arnett Scott, uh, followed, oh, Larissa, have you raised your hand again? Okay, followed by Larissa, followed by Julio. Arnett, and then Eric, okay, Arnett yes. is first. Also, Melissa Rinko. Oh, hi, good evening. Okay. Um, I have just one question. Um, with the um, funding for the Connect Clinics and listening to one of the um, one of the reasons why people are getting, you know, connecting with Henry Street because of the availability. What is the caseload um, maximum for for you guys starting out? Because th there may be a point where it starts to, once the word gets out that they're available and, you know, you have face-to-face, -face, how many can you actually, um, how, what's the what's the caseload maximum for the services at Hamilton and Henry? Sure, I'm happy to answer that. So um, just to give perspective as well. For, so the average caseload for one of our kind of outpatient clinicians is about 35 to 40. The average caseload for a connect clinician is about 20 to 25. Um, and the reason for that is the amount of time they spent going from, you know, they go into people's homes, they go into the community, they spend, do a tremendous amount more coordination as far as other services, case management, um, you know, with our psychiatric nurse practitioner, with other team members. Um, and a lot of our clients are seen more than once a week, um, you know, whether it's a full session or not. So um, I try to keep their caseload somewhere between 20 and 25. Um, and it also depends on who they're seeing. Right. There are some of our clients who are, you know, we have a couple of families who are, among other things, struggling with being asylum seekers and housing situations and all of these things. And that's a lot more than somebody who maybe lives in the community, has stable housing, is struggling with serious mental illness, but they are being medicated and this is kind of a, a support for them. So really kind of I, you know, informally, admittedly, weigh their caseloads as far as like how much time somebody takes, do they travel into the community, how frequently, and then, so it's generally between 20 and 25 though. For Hamilton Madison's, Madison House, we are capping at 20 per clinician. So as of right now, um, we haven't hit that cap yet for clients who specifically only need um, therapy services. 
But at the same time, um, our clinician is also providing um, purely case management services for existing clients from the Article 30, the main um, outpatient clinic. So that often takes up a lot of time as well, because we are also escorting them to other uh, social service offices. And we are, you know, as you know, sometimes if you sit at Social Security, you end up staying there for a couple hours. <laughs> so sometimes visits like that can take a while. Um, so we are also just trying to gauge um, how much time our clinicians have. Okay, um, so hey, Larissa, before I get to you, I'm gonna call on somebody who hasn't spoken yet and then I'll go back to you. So that will be Alyssa Wrinkle. Alyssa? She's still muted. Hi, sorry, here I am. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Alyssa Wrinkle. I'm the program director of the mock downtown team. So we do street outreach, 23rd Street and below. Um, and work with people to get into transitional and then permanent housing. Um, and I think my question is, are you, do you think that the, and first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it's really important and I'm very glad that it's happening. Um, and I can definitely relate to the hiring challenges. Um, do you think that once you're more fully staffed, that canvassing and outreach will become will be able to become more of a priority. I think just from the the street outreach perspective, when we first heard about these teams, we were very excited about the opportunity to connect our clients with them. Um, and I think you know a good a good amount of them um, would come into the clinic. And I think that the reduced wait times is a wonderful thing. But I think that there's so many people, as you know, that, you know, really need you to come to them. And so I'm wondering if the idea of just meeting the person directly where they are on the street um, and trying to engage people like for the first time that way is something that you think you might be able to move toward in the future. That actually is part of the goal. <laughs> I, I would love to be able to set up a consistent um, space for us to, um, you know, meet clients for the first time, do a brief assessment, um, you know, wherever they are, it could be in a park or it could be wherever they hang out the most. And then that way we can introduce our services to them and then have them come to the clinic. Or if they're not comfortable with that, we'll just continue meeting them like where we met them. Um, until they are ready to sort of, uh, I, I guess, graduate to other services. Um, that That is definitely the end goal. Um, but as of right now, due to staffing and just scheduling challenges, uh, we're not able to do that at the moment. So for us, um, we are fully staffed as far as our current kind of financial and budget structure allows. So we do have a larger team. Um, we have three full-time clinicians. Um, I have a case load myself. Um, we have a full-time intake worker, two case managers, a fantastic community liaison, a peer, um, a several consultants. So we have a very large team. Um, it's just the demand has been so high that we have not been able to look outside of our community uh, center, right? We've been actually like talking about, wouldn't it be great to do outreach here or do that or involve there or this? But honestly, it's been this, <laughs> sorry, both my boys are at home. Um, it's great. Um, you know, we've kind of been just, it's hard to go out and look for more clients when you can't deal with the ones that are coming through the front door. Um, we, you know, an example of how much traffic flow we get is we technically had to close intake completely on both sides, our outpatient program and our program for the month of January. We opened up February 1st by the end of February. We were booked through the end of May as far as scheduled intakes. And we had done somewhere near 35 to 40 intakes for the month. Um, and if you look at that, even a full-time work person, that's one to two caseloads. So we really just don't have it. We'd have, we would need a full second team of people in order to be able to do that outreach and do it consistently. So, you know, should things slow down, obviously that's something we can talk about further, but as of right now, it's, you know, we're kind of putting out fires here as it goes. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I can definitely relate to the Sisyphean battle of trying to meet the needs. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, just, you know, my unsolicited two cents is that I think that the people who are coming to clinic are always the people who are like probably are typically the people who are a little bit better off, right? The people that are able to get it together to come in, even if it's like a really low stakes, low threshold walk in, um, they still, you know, have the ability to make it somewhere. Um, And I think that the people that are going to be missed are the people that like, that probably need more help really are the people that won't come to the clinic. Um, so I think, you know, and I, as, as bad as wait times are, there are existing services for people who can come and get services in clinic. And I think that one of, you know, the most exciting things about this, when this first rolled out was the idea that these services would be available to people that like, weren't you know, weren't capable of coming. And I think, you know, I definitely appreciate and recognize the house calls and, but I I still think that the most vulnerable and, uh, you know, already missed population is, is maybe going to be potentially missed here. And I I don't know that there's a solution that you, I, you know, I don't think this is something that you guys can necessarily solve. Um, but just throwing that out there. Yeah, no, I just, I want to point out, give me one second, guys. Um, I want to point out that we, our walk-ins are not like high functioning folks who just don't want to wait for appointments. We have folks who are, you know, very much either actively psychotic or are struggling with addiction, are homeless, are, they have nowhere else to go. But what they hear is that honestly, and our number one motivator is food. We have a food pantry and we feed people. So if you show up and say you haven't eaten, we will feed you. And that is what people brings people through our front door. There's really no other recipe for success other than that. As far as that, it's, we have people who come in and tell me I haven't eaten in four or five days. So before we do the intake, I will order them a sandwich, you know, that kind of thing. So the people walking in our front door are not the people who simply just could have waited for an appointment and didn't want to. Um, And until we can kind of deal with that stream of, of kind of intakes and, you know, our, every one of our groups serves a meal, you know, and it's because we realize a lot of people won't eat other than that. Um, We started a food pantry in response to the, the food insecurity. We offer our showers, we have showers in our building to folks. And these are the reasons they're walking through our front door. Um, And, you know, until we can do that, we really just don't, I would need a full, you know, another 10 staff members and to be able to do I think a quarter of what we would like to do. Um, But no, I I totally understand the, there are folks who can't go out, can't do that. Um, At some point, I would love to be able to explore the idea of having our substance use peer work more in the community as far as making those connections and encouraging people to come. Um, But again, we're just not, we're not there. And I'm not sure, you know, how long down the road we would, you know, need to be in order to get there. Okay. Okay, Alyssa, you're finished with your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Definitely okay. didn't mean to imply you're working with an easy population. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so next will be Larissa, followed by Eric, followed by Julio, followed by Susan. I'll go last. Elizabeth can go before me. Okay. Anyway, next is Larissa. Thank you. Um, so this question is for both centers. Based on the influx of, um, of people who are coming into the clinics, et cetera, and your, the current trends, uh, what do you see as needing more funding? There are specific programs that are, are either underfunded or not funded at all that you see a need for, or is it strictly staffing that would be the, the most important need for you? Because it's a very important that We'd love to hear that you know, what you need to meet the community's um, mental health needs. Um, the the most glaring uh, the most glaring need I think we have is just staffing. There's there's not enough, so that's um, that's going to be our biggest challenge still. Um, you know, we haven't had the same issues staffing as I think a lot of the other clinics. Um, We've been really fortunate. We've been unfortunate to find really great clinicians. We have folks who speak 
you know, the, the required languages and that kind of thing. Um, but I would say as far as staffing for us, it's being able to offer a competitive wage. Um, there are a lot of kind of sectors of, of the mental health field that can pay more. Um, you know, DOE. So glad you brought that up. That's such an important disparity. You know, and to be able to offer a competitive wage to do community work. And in some of the neighborhoods that are, you know, less desirable as some of these private practices or, you know, other roles would be fantastic. I think it would increase the quality of, of the candidates we get. Um, but as of right now, for us, it's just being able to grow, you know, and grow consistently um, and kind of to what capacity is that? Like, we've gotten to a point that our clinic is like bursting at the seams. You know, we like rotate rooms daily and like there's different clinicians and it's really just being able to accommodate the needs of the community. Um, I think this model, and I'm obviously a little biased because I work in it currently, I think the model of the Connect Clinics is fantastic. Um, you know, we're able to look at human beings as human beings and not just diagnoses and be able to support them in ways and be able to do things like help them pay utility bills if that's what you know stressing them, help them get into recovery, you know, help them really kind of do these whole life things. Because obviously if you are hungry or worried about where you're sleeping or you know, worried about, you know, X, Y, and Z, sitting with a case manager is generally the last thing in your mind. And to be able to help with those other needs to be able to then keep them on track as far as these kind of more mental health and, and recovery oriented goals, I think it's great. But um, I think that's absolutely it is just being able to have quality staff, being able to, you know, pay them a, a real wage and then be able to encourage them and keep them within this type of work. Okay, great. Okay, um, the next one is uh, Eric, followed by Julio, followed by Elizabeth, followed by Susan. Hi, so just to, to end it, I guess I wanted to kind of give it an open-ended, you know, respond as you as you think in the, in the current moment. Uh, not a pop quiz, but just you guys are on the field. What's one thing to kind of share with us the community board about uh you know some of the work you're doing in mental health obviously you're not going to have the perfect exhaustive uh, you know spot on answer that encompasses all aspects but just what's kind of something that pops at you that you just like to share with us that maybe folks may not realize or may not know about mental health as you guys are seeing it on a week-to-week -week basis just one or two observations to share with us? Um, I, I'm going to say two things. Um, housing is a huge concern and it affects um, everybody's mental health and it seems to be the primary concern that a lot of our clients are coming in with and on top of that also um, just general education about mental health, um, just understanding what it looks like and how it can actually affect everyone and from all walks of life. Um, that that also seems to be um, a huge barrier for um, some of the clients that we have coming in, like their family members don't understand what's going on. And, you know, they, they've they always had the impression that this would never happen to someone that they knew, at least not, not one of their loved ones. So um, in that in that aspect, we're trying to help address it by providing workshops in, you know, in the languages that they understand and trying to sort of normalize what's going on and how they can actually help their loved ones while they are receiving services from us. So that that's the two things for me. I mean, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more as far as the housing and the stigma associated with mental health care. I think that is just kind of an overarching you know, theme of what we see. But, um, you know, rather than pointing out a problem, I think the best thing about this program and this model and what we're doing is it, it, the Lower East Side, first of all, is an incredible place. Not from New York. Don't even live in the Lower East Side. I just live, I work there. Um, I drive an hour and a half to come work in the Lower East Side every day. Um, I've been involved with Henry Street on and off for 15 years now at this point. Um, but the sense of community in the Lower East Side, I think is really beautiful. And I think it works to the advantage of those who need the mental health support. And what I mean by this is like, even within our own program, it's the relationships I've seen being built between our consumers um, to support each other. Um, and in like these various ways, like we have a lot of groups 
Um, I love our groups. I think it's wonderful because these people, you know, these individuals who have their own struggles, who came in the door for a reason, are now turning and supporting each other. Um, and you don't see that everywhere. Um, you know, and, and the ways that people find kind of their voice and their identity and courage to go forward in their journeys towards mental health is really beautiful. Um, like we have a ceramics program and people are like die hard into this group and the way that they support each other and create this beautiful art and they find like expression and purpose. And it really does help them work towards their mental health goals is very cool. So I think just looking at mental health as this like larger, more community oriented oriented like dynamic thing versus this individual process that like we really look at in the medical model right there's less, like a deficit if you have medication and therapy you'll be fine but it's like this much larger organic thing with it like when people wrap around each other everybody does better you both gave incredible answers by the way so thank you for your insights okay great okay so next is Julio, followed by Elizabeth, followed by Susan, followed by Arnett. I'll go last. <laughs> okay. Uh, Julio. All right. <laughs> Real quick, uh, what you said that a lot of the people that come to the clinic, they usually come for food or shower or something else. Do you see them coming regularly? Is it a struggle for them to come back and keep receiving the care? Do you guys have to constantly go to them or just curious about that? I mean, for us, the majority of folks are really active and participatory in our programs. And if we do end up going to folks, it's one of two reasons. We have a lot of folks who struggle with health reasons. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's inequity in the health care system as well, not just the mental health care system. Um, so we go to them for that reason, but really the only reason my team actively has to go out for folks is if they decompensate and when they stop reaching out to us and they stop participating and they stop calling their case management, that's when we start to worry a little bit. And that's when we do a lot more outreach and we do see folks in the community, um, you know, but what I mean, like reaching out to us or coming to us in terms of like, they're the ones who initiate contact. They're the ones who set up their appointments. They're the ones who ask, you know, are we still on for next Wednesday? But when we stop getting that, we know that our, you know, our outreach is necessary. All right. Same thing with Hamilton or? Um, being that uh, we don't, we're not able to provide showers <laughs> at our, um, at okay. our location. Um, so we don't really see clients coming in for that. But um, we do have our clients coming in more consistently, and the ones who um, who do not are usually the ones who have had our, had their concrete needs met already. Um, so their case management uh, needs are already done, and then that's when we usually see a drop off. But um, we do reach out to them on a continuous basis for uh, at least three months, um, and if they say that oh they're no longer meeting our services, then we start the you know discharge process. But we do continuously offer um, their therapy, um, psychiatric services, and, you know, again, it's on them to uh, sort of tell us if they would like to continue, and we're still here, like, we're not going anywhere. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next is Elizabeth. Hi, yeah, I'll be super quick. Um, I just wanted to address, you know, a, an excellent point that I think Elisa made, which is even with Connect, which we're very proud of, having clinicians leave the clinic um, to sometimes go out in the community, um, you know, recognizing that that is, that is sometimes, right? It's not like something that, you know, the clinici clinicians are, are able and, and um, can afford to do all of the time. And, and for some, as Alyssa kind of said, for some that's that's not gonna that's not gonna be enough. That's not gonna uh, meet their needs. I I do want to just point out, and I know uh, Alyssa kind of is probably already familiar with this, but for the rest of the folks on the committee, um, that uh, our office does operate intensive mobile treatment teams. Um, those are treatment teams that are only based in the community, like the psychiatrists go to the street corner to, you know, talk to people <laughs> about their medications. Um, uh, so we, we do have um, 31 of those teams. Um, it's probably not enough. Um, 
but I just wanted to throw out there that just so the committee knows that there there is this other um, level of, of service um, that was also a demonstration project as as the Connect Clinic is. And if anyone, if if you all were interested, I'd be happy to connect you with um, folks that can you know talk more about um, what that treatment team is. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Arnett seems to have put her hand down. So, uh, Susan, you can speak next. Thank you. Um, I'd like maybe to do a little bit of a wrap up. I would like to reflect that we say we're talking about people who haven't eaten for four or five days or who may be actually so ill that they can't get themselves into the clinic and just kind of reflect on that, that we should be in this position of talking about that. Um, I'm going to thank Elizabeth for coming. Um, I had called her at the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene uh, for help in understanding the CONNECT program because we were so uh, excited about getting it. And she voluntarily, voluntarily offered to come um, to this meeting. So I you know, really appreciate that. And uh, Alyssa Wrinkle is actually the person I work with on a consistent basis. Uh, from Goddard regarding homeless, and she's uh, been amazing. And as Whitney uh, alluded to in our community, we're extremely fortunate to have the um, the settlement houses like uh, that we have, like Henry Street and Hamilton Madison. I'd say the only thing wrong with these programs is that they're not ten times bigger. And I, so I want to still um, just acknowledge the gap in outreach street services. It's not anybody here's fault, but um, it's that we're not as a society doing enough. And we have city and state elected officials here. Um, so I wanna know, so the connect programs, um, I've, my understanding is state programs that now had city funding to enhance them. So I would like to know from, all of our, um, or ask of all of our elected reps here to please help us um, uh, enhance these programs further. It's clearly needed. Um, that's what, that's all. I just, you know, wanna know what we can do to um, make these really incredible programs um, even, even bigger and being able to reach more people. And of course, you know, the staff, uh, the disparity in staff pay is unconscionable and the city needs to do something about that too, which then goes back to our um, city elected officials. Yeah. I guess yeah. maybe I would city like, state. Yeah, I would just like to talk. Yeah, I mean, I think that it can be bigger, but then the disparity in staff pay is important because, um, you know, I'm just wondering about, you know, um, you know, you know, the, you know, you make, uh, the, the, the salaries are not competitive, you know, and that also can affect, you know, your ability to recruit people, you know, and keep them. So, you know, and this is such an important program. So, um, okay, I don't see any other hands raised. So, if, okay. so we will continue the discussion, but I'm glad to have everyone here today. And, you know, we learned so much and, you know, the community board, we, you know, advocate for resources and funding. And so I think this conversation was very helpful in terms of learning, you know, about what we need to know and do. Okay, so. Can I, can I just also add that we really need the press to, um, to uh, throw sunshine on this also. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay, certainly true. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will now move on to our next agenda item. Uh, which is from NYU Langone. Um, everybody else is, uh, we are welcome to stay for that because um, they're also talking about a health program that they are doing, a caregiver you know, um, support program. Uh, but if you uh, need to leave, you're also free to go. Okay, so um, let's see. So next we have Lisa. Yes. Lisa, she is from NYU Langone and she's going to uh, present the, about the, um, caregiver support program. Yeah. I know it's not the exact name of the program, but that's basically what that's you do, fine. right? That's okay. fine. It's very long. So um, I put, I had put the, uh, 
maybe Nadia, you can put it back in. I already put the brochure link in the in the uh, chat. So you probably have heard uh, if you listen to last week's uh, community board meeting, the general meeting, I, I spoke for a few minutes. So as Susan um, told me that I'm not here to try to convince you about this, the importance of caregiver support because I did that last week, but I'm just gonna reiterate that caregiver burnout for those caring for someone with dementia is, it's like an epidemic. We have caregivers coming to us that just don't know where to turn. Now I have Nadia Kishotka here, is here today. She's a licensed clinical social worker in our program. We also have Alice greenberg Shidi, who is another one of our social workers. Um, but Nadia is going to discuss the program and, and you know briefly discuss what the program is about. And then I would love to see how we can brainstorm and how can we reach your community the best, the best way because you know your community the best. And uh, we would like to try to work that way. Okay, so Nadia. Thank you, Lisa. Um, like, my, like Lisa said, my name is Nadia. I'm one of the social workers at the Family Support Program. And uh, we provide social work consultations to caregivers, to people with dementia. And that can be either individual consults or family consults. Um, it is, we try to do short-term consultations um, around caregiving issues. Um, that really varies on the individual. Sometimes people need more supportive counseling around uh, caregiving. Um, some people have a therapist already and they just need more concrete resources. So we really kind of see where the client and caregiver is at and kind of work from there. Um, in addition to those, in addition to that, even though we try to do short-term consultations, the caregiver is, once they're in our program, they're in our program. So a lot of times we have caregivers that will meet with us initially and then kind of feel like things are kind of stable. And then maybe a couple of months later or even years later will come back to us because things have changed or they need additional support or additional resources. So they can always come back and contact us um, for that support as well. Um, we have under the umbrella of our program, we have joint enrichment programs, which are programs that are designed for the caregiver and care receiver to do together. And that could be um, a museum tour, a jazz concert, a dance uh, performance. We offer them um, every Tuesday usually and um, in the afternoon and most of them are being held on Zoom but the coordinator of that program has been trying to do some in-person programs and is hoping to do a little bit more in-person programming now that the weather is getting warmer. Um, we also have a recreational therapist who does um, groups for the people with dementia and the idea of that is to serve, sort of serve as a respite for the caregiver. Um, her groups are, before the pandemic, they were about three hours long. The idea was that the caregiver could drop the person off and have some time to themselves. Obviously now it's changed a little bit. So the groups are held on Zoom, um, but the, the rec therapist is also bringing back some of the in-person programming and keeping those groups smaller. And she does art-based, and creative movement based groups. And then we also have a consultant that works with her on Fridays who does a dance based group. Um, and then we also offer support groups. We have support groups. Most of our support groups are spousal support groups. So either women caring for their husbands, there's a mixed gender group, and then there's a men's group uh, for those caring for their partners. And uh, we have a caring from afar group. And those are individuals that are either here in New York City and caring for somebody uh, out of the city or vice versa. Um, and one thing that we introduced actually during the pandemic um, is what we call the coffee clutch. And that is more of an informal support group. The idea behind it was that many caregivers wanted a group, but were not able to commit to something weekly. So they wanted a drop-in type situation. So we started the coffee clutch. And initially we were just doing it 
once a month, but it became really popular. So now we offer it every other week. Um, and some people attend every other week, but there's no commitment to do so. And that's, um, that's not a clinical group. It's run by two of our, our colleagues, but they're not social workers. So it's, it's sort of become a peer-led group. Um, and, and caregivers really like it because they share sort of different resources and techniques and, and tips and tools. And it really, um, I think it's been really supportive for many of our caregivers, just knowing that they can drop in when they need, you know, even if it's a month later, they can just come in and join the group. And because it's mixed caregivers, you can, you'll meet a lot of different people. Um, and then we have the buddy program, which is a program that's run in two semesters, the fall and spring semester, where um, a person with dementia in our program is paired with an NYU student, an undergraduate student who is taking a class um, learning about Alzheimer's disease. And so the idea is that the buddy, the NYU buddy would visit the person with dementia over the course of eight weeks, one time a week. Um, and the person with dementia would serve sort of as a mentor to that student. And they don't really talk about the dementia. They don't talk about the class. It's just sort of a lot. It's really just more of a companion and a friendship. And um, many times I hear caregivers tell me that they wind up keeping in touch with the buddies long after the program has ended. Um, so that's always a really popular program. And we also do ongoing webinars. Uh, we do we tried to do different trainings. Um, some we do the same every year, self-care, navigating home care. Um, we do caregiving during the holidays. Um, and then we also do what we call the CARES training, which is um, a module that talks about communicating more effectively with someone with dementia. We're also able to provide that training to the caregivers so they can do it on their own pace as well. Um, so we try to do that training three to four times a year. Um, am I missing anything, Lisa? Um, we also have the memory cafe. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yes. That. Yeah. We have a memory cafe once a month. Um, and it was in person, of course. But now it is, um, I don't know, they're, they're going to have another one soon in person. But now um, I think the one last month was in person, I believe. Oh, yeah. And they love it. It's just fantastic. And uh, Burgunda is in charge of this and she is able to get people from all over to come and perform. Um, and so that that's great. The Memory Cafe is, uh, is really a, a wonderful thing because they get together and it's like a party. It is a party. But caregivers, that's another joint enrichment. The caregiver and the person they're caring for come together. So um, basically that's what our program is about. Um, we are state funded and completely free. We will never ask for a dime or where you came from or anything. So we're, we have open arms for everyone. Um, Our Catchment area though, we do work with caregivers and care receivers in Manhattan, Brooklyn and Staten Island. If we do have a caregiver that comes in that lives in Queens or the Bronx, we do have partnerships with PSS and Sunnyside who also provide similar services under the same grant. So we are able to refer to them for the, for, for the Queens and Bronx uh, and, caregivers. And, but today I, I got one client the caregiver was in England who called me caring for his parents here in Manhattan. And we can take care of, of him because either one or the other has to live within the catchment area. So it just so happens that his parents live in Manhattan. So he's in our catchment area and we're happy to, to help him the best we can long distance. Um, and many times that happens, like the adult child will call on behalf of a parent wanting to get help for that parent who is the primary caregiver. And sometimes we'll meet with the adult child individually or do family consults. So it, it really can vary depending on the family structure and sort of where they're at and what they're looking for. Sometimes uh, caregivers call that they need emotional support. They're losing it. They're overwhelmed. And like today, I got another call. <clears throat> Pardon me. Today I got another call from a caregiver who 
was straight out. I, if you know, you're going, going to associate me with a social worker, I don't need emotional support. I just need, you know, to know this, this, and this. That's fine. That whatever you need, as far as uh, being a caregiver to help you and the person you're caring for, that's why we're here. And when they do the intake, they are referred to a social worker and we will, you know, give them a call, do our assessment. But like Lisa said, sometimes they do not want the social work consultations and they just want to participate in the joint enrichment or the rec therapy program. And that is fine. You, they can kind of do all of it, you know, some of it, a mix of everything. So they can really tailor it to what supports and services they need. And that we realize that also keeps changing for people as well. Most of our, in, our um, care consultations with the social workers, mostly they're on Zoom. I don't know which social workers are willing or not or can see people in person yet, um, but they're definitely on Zoom by phone, even by email if, if must, you know, they wanna communicate that way. Um, I do the intakes along with um, my two colleagues who are also community health reps. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, the state, you know, as you know, when you have a state grant, they require all this data in return. <laughs> And so, you know, we'll have to do this 20 minute intake, which, you know, it's fine. People are really good about it. But once you do the intake, you hear the person's voice just by doing the intake. They thank you so much for just listening. And, um, and I know there's so many people out there. I, I want to reach them. I want to reach them in your neighborhood. If you can think of venues, places we can go in person, health fairs, uh, churches, any kind of community events that you think we can come and, and, and share the love, just please let me know. And we've oh. done, um, sorry, just to piggyback on what Lisa said, like we ha have been open to doing these outreach and just talking about our program, but also um, with another community health rep in, in Harlem, uh, she and I did a, a presentation on brain health. So we are also open to doing sort of presentations to kind of help educate people about dementia and sort of things to look out for and signs to look out for. Mm -hmm. So we're very open to kind of tailoring it to what oh, the yeah. need may be. We can actually do, you know, if we if I get it together, I can get a, a doctor from maybe the Pearl Barlow Center to come and answer questions. Many times seniors are concerned. I mean, I know that even sometimes I'm forgetting once in a while and I worry like, oh, you know, what's happening? Many times they have questions like, what if, what if, or my friend, you know, and um, so we wanna be here for all those questions. And Basically, that's it about the program. We're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, okay, so we do have uh, some hands raised. Um, well, we have one hand raised for more, and we'll probably have more later. But before we just do that, I just wanted to ask, are you already serving people in the CB3 area? And also, what languages do you speak? Yes, we are serving people all over Manhattan, and yes, some from the CB3 area, mm -hmm. um, all different parts of Manhattan. Uh, we can do uh, well English and Spanish right now. We we are we again because of the grant we we would love to have Chinese but we don't have it yet not yet. But we can get an interpreter. Yeah. Hopefully, someone from that family will speak English and be an interpreter also. All right, um, Susan, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was going to suggest as far as uh, for you to connect with people, you mentioned health fairs. And I was going to say, you know, we have a lot of summer street events. I would not go to the multi-street multi big festivals because those are tourists. Mm -hmm. But we have lots of health, health fairs and what we call single block festivals, which are as community festivals. Mm -hmm. And the only problem is that we are a trilingual community. Um, so, you know, that would be the only, uh, only problem. And- uh, What? I didn't get that. 
we're a trilingual community. Oh yeah, I know. So um, that's, well, well, that's we, the only barrier I see, you know, I think being on the street in community so events. We're working with, who's doing Chinese, Caring Kind? I think Caring Kind. Caring yeah, Kind we, will do the Chinese for us. Okay, well, um, as far as getting the list of upcoming events, um, I can I can get them to you or I can put you in touch with the you know the mayor's office of street activity because they're they're signing up now for you know the next the next six months. Mm -hmm. Oh great, that would be great. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other question? Uh Larissa. Thank you. And thank you for coming and explaining your wonderful program. Um, it's wonderful to see people being able to stay in their home with their family as caregivers and spouses. So my question is also about outreach. Uh, do you outreach to the nursing homes, the skilled nursing facilities within the city, public and private? Um, and during the pandemic, like how have you shifted your mode of outreach uh, to catch more people who are maybe they're not as tech savvy uh, maybe they just don't have time to go on the computer. Right. Um, believe it or not, during COVID, we were bombarded with caregivers. Um, and it seems that most people are pretty happy to go on Zoom. You know, we were really nervous about it when it first began. Is this going to work via Zoom? And it they prefer it. They don't have to leave. They don't have to get someone to watch their person with dementia for the hour. Uh, they don't have to drag their person out with them. Um, a lot of the caregivers, and I think Nadia can tell you that um, they were really losing their minds with um, being overwhelmed because they were working from home and they, the, the home care person, they were like no home care people. Nobody wanted to come. And it, it was horrible. Nadia, you have something better to say? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think um, even prior to the pandemic, we also offered Zoom consults and phone consultations because we realized not everybody can get into the office because they're either working or at home with someone. So we know we knew it was not always possible for them. And we do have, um, there's four social workers and a few of us are willing to do in-person as needed. So that option is still there, but at least from my, my caregivers, even when I've offered it, none of them have wanted to come see me in person. So um, I think they just really appreciate the convenience of being able to sometimes even work, like, you know, take the call during their own lunch break um, and not feeling like they have to commute to see me. So I think it's really been, mm -hmm. actually, we were sort of worried about, you know, not reaching out, not being able to reach certain people. Um, but we found that it actually, like Lisa said, we were really bombarded. We were bombarded. It was insane the way. And I think another thing was also, I mean, not, I know a lot of programs either just had to shut down or, you know, they totally changed, you know, how they worked. And I think we were still available. And because we were already providing the Zoom and phone consults, we already had that system kind of up and running. So mm -hmm. we were able to just kind of continue, um, you know, sort of where, where we left off. And I think that made it easier for people to feel that continued support from us. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, and well, one other thing with the uh, skilled nursing facilities, are you reaching out specifically here in our community to Gouverneur um, skilled nursing facility? Well, what we really do is to use the skilled nursing facilities as a resource. So we vet them and we put them on our list. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to go to the NORCs um, and, and speak with, with uh, those residents. Um, a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility or even an assisted living. Assisted livings, if a person in assisted living now we're talking about assisted living. If they need support, there's usually someone there um, in a, an assisted living. Well, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking of patients who may have been coming in for maybe a 
inpatient therapy before they're able to be released home. And like that may be another area to where you can pick up on people who um, may be returning to their homes. Well, their that, we do not see the person with memory loss, only the caregiver. But I have, I have, no, right, right. I, I have connected with the social workers at certain facilities. If the person, like the caregiver that's already in our program, and the person mm -hmm. they're caring for has gone into a facility, we will sort of coordinate care and try to work with them and talk with them and kind of help make sure everyone's sort of on the same page. So we do, we have done that. Okay, terrific. But your program is for the caregiver. Correct, yes. yes. All, right, okay. All right, right, okay. Um, I don't see any, any other hands raised right now. Um, if anybody at this meeting, you still have a question, uh, please raise your hand uh, because I'm, gonna, I'm going to close this um, agenda item if okay. I don't see any hands raised. Well, I'd okay. like to say thank you to all of you for yes, listening to you. us. And I look forward to getting that list. And any questions, please do not hesitate to call program. It's in the um, in the chat. The uh, how do we keep this chat? I don't know how to do that. So I want to look at something after we hang up. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to working together. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, so our um, final agenda item is all CAB and CEC reports. Uh, uh, first of all, I, in terms of hospital CABs, uh, the Presbyterian CAB, you know, the downtown hospital Presbyterian CAB is, um, we need a new rep. Okay, so our last rep was Ricky, who has left the board. And then oh, for a while we had Laura, Laura Lugo. Um, but Laura is no longer on our committee and she uh, also does not have time to serve on that cab. So we are looking. Uh, so if you are interested in serving on the Presbyterian Hospital cab, let me know. Um, I'm we still have to, okay, we still have to get the schedule and their meetings are during the day. Okay, they, um, you're interested, Eric, aren't you already on the, yeah. What, do you need more to do, Eric? You seem <laughs> to have a lot to do. I'm happy to be on that one. Okay, so let me uh, get- Eric, Robert. I plan on putting you to work on my committee, <laughs> I'm giving you her. You're in high demand, Eric. Yeah. Okay, so well, all right, so Eric has raised his hand. Okay, so if, uh, anyway, so if there is interest, you know, please let me know. Um, Eric, if you're still interested, please let me know because Larissa wow. might take you for something else. She might take you to another committee, it's okay, <laughs> or to another camp. Um, yeah, well, so he's I, on Gouvenier, so I, I'm going to make him work really hard. No problem. I'll be back. All right. Okay, so let me find out the schedule. As I said, the meetings are during the, I mean, last year the meetings were during the day and um, they were like in the middle of the day. Um, so for some people that's lunch hour, for, from some people, you know, they're still working. Uh, last year it was on Zoom and they say they want to go back to in-person. It's three times a year. Yeah, okay. No problem, sign me up, May. Okay, we'll sign you up. Okay, great. Okay, so now we, um, I'm just going to take reports from CABs or CECs who have met. Uh, we'll start with the CEC, Arnett. Hi, um, we met, uh, um, our last meeting was actually the same day as um, this meeting. And what, we, what was discussed, I had to do a report on my visit with um, Shung Win PS184 and I want to share what I've um, learned from that with us, um, with this as well, with this, with the CP3. Um, uh, Dr. K, or, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, so I can't remember it now. But Dr. K, who is the principal of PS184, has started a couple of initiatives that would outreach to the community, which I found were great. 
he has a soccer team and he wanted to also incorporate schools in the um, in the district to join. Um, and he also offered his actual space for them to practice. And um, um, you know, if, if the issue was they didn't have um, a soccer field or the um, you know, soccer field or an, an available space to practice, he offered the school and and their soccer little soccer field is so not amazing, but really, really cute and wonderful. It's not extra big, but it's 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 big enough for um for a school to practice with or a team to practice with. Um he wanted to reach out to Henry Street and other uh, other CBOs that can probably um help facilitate um initiating conversations about activities, team sports for the um community so that it would be more interactive. Hold on a second, I'm sorry. Sorry, I have to talk to my daughter. Um, he wanted to initiate speaking to CBOs or anybody that can help facilitate him to have a, a better um, or a more cohesive communication with other schools so that he can, so they, we can have more of a district led sports team. And he's using so soccer as the um, first sport. Um, also, um, he wanted to let the community know that the middle school, although Tongwen is a dual language school, there's a middle school for an entry level track so that children that are have not experienced dual language would not be excluded from the school. So this will help also for um, help also get more children that within the district that haven't gone through matriculated through a dual language or um, Shangwen to have the ability to go to the middle school. And um, he was just really interested in finding new ways in order to connect with the community, learn more about the community and have the school to be a little more um, inclusive in its um, admissions. And just really, it was really a good good meeting. I was there for about two hours, just learning about um, the school and connecting with, connecting with him about um, the community. So it was really good. I was happy to, um, Put that to the CEC, and um, hopefully from there we'll we'll be able to connect with him again, and hopefully we'll have other schools that will be interested in starting a soccer league and having a district one soccer team, which we, I think would be fantastic. Um, also, we have our elections coming up, so we were outreaching to potential um, candidates and parents within the school district to to um register to um nominate themselves to be elected into the CEC. And I think that was primarily the yeah, um that was primarily it. And as well as the superintendent's um report in which she spoke about coming to C B three and hoping to have more meetings and be invited into the um into our monthly meetings so that she can report more information. I don't know if she's gotten back to Susan about the questions we, um, that were posed to her last month, but and if she hasn't, just let me know and I'll um, reach back out to her. That's about I, it. I don't think so. I'm, I'm not remembering, but I'll check. Okay, Susan, I'll, um, after I get off with our, um, off this meeting, I'll text her just to um, FYI, like, hey, you know, if you haven't responded, you know, this, tonight would be great. <laughs> well, you know, it's possible that she hasn't and, and, and uh, got lost in a million. So I will check and and, and see if I have an email from her. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't recall. I, I, the only thing I recall is that she said that, you know, she'd like the, um, or the, the IB school to come, the, the global leader school to, um, they're doing outreach, she said last, you know, starting in March. And, you know, we had offered that they, if they wanted to come to committee to present about their program, you know, that you know, it would, could be arranged. And then also she um, had set up another meeting which she had to uh, postpone, yes. but it was uh, with community groups. Um, and it was about resources for the kids um, of the asylum seekers who are enrolled in D1 schools. I think it was asylum seekers and, and others. I think they were including other refugees also. Yeah, yeah I think it included refugees They're as well. Including refugees. Right. 
Um, so we'll hear about that later. Okay. Well, I'll reach back out with her to to see when she would if she'll be available um, for our next month's meeting with some more updates. Because if she started doing this in March, I think this is pretty early for her to give a really a tangible update. So I'll reach back out to her see if she'll be available for April. Okay. Okay. Um, hospital cabs. Gouverneur. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've been very busy. Uh, we just wrapped up our budget advocacy day again uh, this year. It was via Zoom. We did not go to Albany. Uh, we sent out invitations. Unfortunately, this year, none of the elected officials, either Brian Kavanaugh or Grace Lee, were able to attend. Um, we did forward our presentation to both representatives, and we hope that they did have time to look over the presentations. Um, and at least I didn't receive any questions. I'm hoping that there were no questions that they were um, able to support our um, our points of advocacy for our facilities. Um, these are very important uh, budgetary priorities for health and hospitals overall as a group, and also not uh, not to, not to uh, leave out Gouverneur. Um, we are getting ready to lose quite a few of our members. They are terming out on our committee and I have begun an, an outreach campaign with physicians within Gouverneur, asking them to recommend um, current patients at Gouverneur uh, and to speak with them about the board uh, and to pass their names on if they have questions about joining our board because I would love to see more participation from uh, patients there at Gouverneur on the board so we get more of their voices. Um, thirdly, we are in the process of preparing questions uh, that we would like to bring to the uh, community boards two and three uh, regarding services for Gouverneur and uh, what you would like to see. We have a lovely space on the first floor that is open for expansion and something is going to go in there. And we're hoping that we can get a, an urgent care that will see people on a sliding scale. There have been also uh, ideas floated for a uh, expansion of our PT and uh, physical, ther physical therapy services and for a diabetes center. So we would love to have the input of the community and the community boards as well as stakeholders uh, to uh, what they would like to see going in there and why that why do they feel that that's so important for the community? Um, I think that about, well, we're all the last thing is that we are preparing our CRC report, uh, which is the report on what's been going on at Gouverneur. Um, it includes uh, facts like uh, our Prescati scores, which is our patient, uh, patient uh, satisfaction scores, uh, financial turnover, staffing uh, shortages, et cetera, and also community concerns and needs and feedback. So that will be presented in May. And so we're in the process of preparing that. Okay. Any questions for Larissa? Oh, so Larissa, um, you know, you mentioned this feedback from CB2 and 3. Um, how, yes. are, how is that to be done? Uh, is there um, going to be a, just so we, it's more for planning. Yes, we're going to, uh, yes, so um, we have the initial list of questions. Uh, we, this month we will be going over and refining them to make sure we have exactly how we would like to ask them. And then I'll be approaching you to get us on the, on the agenda for the meeting to come and speak to, um, to our board members. Okay. Okay. So let us know. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So in terms of the hospital cabs, I also um, need to mention that we need a new, I'm looking for another volunteer, another person um, to be our Bellevue cab rep. Um, so as I said, Laura has left the committee. Um, she's actually moved on over to the land use committee and she no longer wishes to serve on that cab um, to represent CB3. So uh, Susan is getting information from the cab president to find out the process because Laura had to go, you know, you have to go through quite a process with Bellevue. 
So we're, we're, we're find, trying to find out if it's the same process to replace or not. Oh, so Susan, did you find, get anything from them? Um, I haven't even started, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, all right, okay. So we'll, we'll just wait on that, okay. Um, all right, so any other tabs? Oh, not, yes, a, Susan? not a cab, I can report uh -huh. on things though. Um, okay. Uh, just two things to report. Um, we were informed by DHS today that um, Windsor Hotel at 108 Foresight is gonna be a shelter for adult family asylum seekers and there, um, it'll be 40 families. They're starting now, but it'll be a slow ramp up. And because at this point there's such a lack of providers um, and it's so immediately needed, um, DHS will operate and then eventually turn it over to a provider called Destination Tomorrow. So we're gonna start hearing about providers we've never heard of. Um, and then the other report is, as um, we've reported before that we hired a consultant to do um, a mental health resource directory for our area. So she has um, finalized her questions and her database of, uh, places to outreach to. And so she will now start outreaching um, with the survey. And that's it. All right. um, Julio, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry, real quick. Susan, can you just repeat that again with the DHS uh, shelter? Is this, you said this for asylum seekers and can you tell me the location again? Yeah, it's in district one, it's 108 Forsyth. All right, thank you. Our, my colleague missed our weekly meeting this morning, so I wasn't uh, notified of that, but thanks. Okay, do they notify, like I know they notified District 1 because they also forwarded to me, but do they notify all the districts? Yeah, there's a weekly uh, meeting by the mayor's office. Um, it's usually every Thursday where they give us an update um, on all the different hercs, uh, the, the amount of people that they're cared of, um, I can provide you the, uh, uh, with the notes from each weekly meeting because my colleague does take them. Um, that, would be, that would be wonderful since community boards don't reach to that level. I'm very <laughs> Great. So I will, very I, will send those, <laughs> <laughs> I will send you those over. My colleague does attend them every Thursday, but he didn't miss this one. So we that's why I wasn't aware of that new one. But thanks. I'll I'll, I'll continue to. I'll give you those notes. Thanks, thanks. that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Susan, you said it was 40, you said adults or families? 40 adult families. In other families words, like husband and wife, but no kids under 18. Okay. Oh, so that it could be children over 18 or like 20 or something like that, right? Yes, as, yes, or it could be a brother and adult brother and sister. It's just adult families. Okay, uh, you just... Was I didn't know the definition. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. That's me. My hand is raised. I know it's brown, blending into the background. Oh, no, I'm looking at the, oh, I see. Oh, because I have my cursor over your thing. Okay, sorry. It blends <laughs> into the wood. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm here. Um, thanks. So a couple of questions. Um, I actually have a quick question for Julia. What H E R C. You said Herx. What what is that? What is that an acronym for? Uh, it, what? That's the emergency shelters for asylum emergency. seekers. I don't remember the exact title, but that's what they're calling them, Herx. Okay. Um, so it stands right. for humanitarian. Believe it or Humani not. <laughs> yeah, humanitarian. Okay. I don't quite remember it, so I don't want to get it wrong. But that's no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. The, the description is is good enough. And then I guess my question is for Susan. Um, it's it's. A question sort of slash common. Um, you know, I live right on Roosevelt Park, and I know that that every time a shelter for anybody who's experiencing homelessness comes up in this community, it's a big thing. It's a huge thing. And I I guess now that I know the term a herc, I understand that the hotel at the corner of Bowery and uh Grand. Is is that am I am I correct in saying that that is also an emergency shelter for asylum seekers? 
There is one on land in CB2. It's on the CB2. It's on the CB2 side, yeah. but it's on it's on the corner of the Bowery. And okay, so within this community, and now on the corner of Forsyth and Broom is going to be a second emergency. And, and I know we need to we need to do this, but I, I guess I'm curious why is there a difference in terms of community notification for um asylum seekers versus trying to provide support supportive housing and services for people who are experiences experiencing homelessness because i'm going to name an elephant in the room that we're talking about two distinct populations of people we're talking about black and brown mostly men and we're talking about folks who are coming into the community who are primarily um, asylum seekers from other countries i'm not making any kind of judgment i'm just naming the difference so I guess that's a twofold question. What what's the situation in terms of notification of the community when there is this kind of a, a supportive house of come supportive housing coming in? Um, that's actually the big question. So for a shelter <clears throat> that is planned, we are notified and like like we were for the one on East Broadway mm. when they um, are discussing a contract, they notify us. And we have actually input, even though we don't support or not support, they're not asking us, but they're notifying us. And, you know, we, as we have in the past, given input about and are asked questions about, about how issues will be dealt with, whether it's enough security, programming, that sort of thing. Um, with these asylum seekers, a bus is coming in. That's that's the notification they have. A bus is arriving. So the, they don't have any planning. So as the bus comes in and they say, okay, we're taking them here, they're notifying us at the same time. I mean, I, I you know, I walk by that that hotel's on my corner and I walk by there and it's not, I know that the Bowery Hanby Hotel was empty for a, a while and it had been a shelter during COVID. The Windsor Hotel was a functioning hotel. It seems pretty quick that it's now, you know, being flipped over to to accept folks who are coming in. Um, I don't know. I just, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Um, and I, I, I guess, I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by if, if most people don't know if it's going to be that it's going to be. Um, housing for asylum seekers, then there's not gonna be, you know, sort of like, why is this happening? And how is this happening in our community? And we have two within three blocks of each other. I, I am struck by the difference yeah, in the I, identities of the folks. I will say the one at CB2, yeah. um, there are no negative issues whatsoever. The community board there is working closely to help them with, um, you know, get their kids into school, get them proper supplies. Yeah. Yeah. Close. Um, there's actually been a, a close relationship built up between uh, the shelter and the board. There is certainly no no negative issues that there anyone's bringing up, other than the fact that you know we, that people are in this horrible situation. Right, and I guess the, in a, my my response to that would be there wasn't an opportunity for there to be a situation where this other population of folks that needed desperately needed services could have been in a position to say there are no negative you know there haven't been any any negative um situations or circumstances that came do you know what i mean it's sort of no, I, I, I don't what i'm don't. saying what i'm saying is that yes i appreciate that there aren't anything there isn't anything negative that has happened having the families come in i guess what i'm struck by was is currently that that the use of that building for support of a different population of people never got an opportunity for us to sit here and say there haven't been any issues because it was just stopped in its tracks before before it happened um you and there's, to the one we lost yeah there's nothing i'm not i, I just i'm pointing this out i'm just Sarah, saying you're, you're yeah. right you're right yeah. and yeah. i will tell you almost every time i talk to dhs yeah I, I do not let them forget that. It's just, it's it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It was appalling. It was wrong. 
And we, I'm very glad that we did a resolution about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not, I can just tell you, it's not going to be forgotten. Yeah. And, and, you know, I we'll we'll see what happens. Cause I guess I, it, it just seems like, you know, our, for a community, for our community, I mean, and I appreciate that there have to be things that have to be done for folks that are being bussed in, but it's, it's again, a situation that was, that people raised a concern that, you know, two, two setups for a specific population within a few blocks of each other, you know, it, anyway, I'll stop, I'll stop here. I'm just, I yeah, guess so I'm just surprised because they were, they were a functioning hotel. So I'm surprised to hear that they now are being utilized in this way. So if I could just add one thing, when you talk about um, enough facilities for particularly adult men. So the problem is that we have one adult male shelter and it's, it's big. People that run it are very good people, but you know, it's very difficult to do that well, particularly mm -hmm. when you have a congregate shelter. Yeah. And so people don't wanna even accept services. Right. That so with the kind of, um, and yes, they would be much more likely to accept services in a hotel. Um, and they did, the proof of that is during COVID when they were being offered hotels, yeah. they did accept services. Um, and yes, that is, you know, it's not just that we need shelters, but we need that kind of housing, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, there wasn't a question in there anywhere. It just, it, I was just struck by it. So thank you for yeah, letting you me. know, um, uh, you know, Deborah, the Herc is like, you know, that Brooklyn cruise terminal. That, that's what the Herc is. So the hotel is not a Herc, you know, in terms of terminology, you know that, right? I'm not following. Oh no. The, you asked what a Herc was an H. -E oh yeah. No, I, I got, I got, yes. I got the answer that it is. It is emergency shelter for asylum seekers. Yeah, it's at Brooklyn, yeah. for example, the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, actually there was a little, I went to the CB2 meeting, you know, it was a webinar, but they talked about a little bit about that too, how there's still this population, you know, they talked about, it was like adult men, you know, homeless men who are still in need and, you know, and still, you know, it's, it's they, yeah, start, so. they don't put them in their in their community <laughs> right, right. right and that and yeah, yeah that, I, guess, it, yeah. I guess i guess i guess i guess that's the part that that just the stark contrast between the way that that the community rallied and part of it has to do with the fact that there was advanced notification i guess but the way that the community rallied against a specific population but is absolutely you know, okay, there's a different population and we're not gonna, we're not gonna say anything and they're just fine. I'm just naming that as a difference, so. Yeah, yeah. You, know. I, you know, I would like to credit, you know, some of the immigrant rights, you know, coalitions and advocacy groups who have done a lot of work to sort of change that, you know, change that, you know, um, because in some, actually at the CB2 meeting, they said it was mainly in Manhattan it's mainly the Manhattan groups that are communities that are more welcoming, you know, but in other boroughs, they're not. And it's usually, you know, those immigrants are coming in and they don't pay taxes and it's, it's, more, it's more that kind of narrative. So a lot of the immigrant rights groups have um, for years sort of, you know, tried to, you know, uh, you know, advocate against that narrative and they pushed especially hard when those buses started coming in. So that kind of helped, you know, in terms of those asylum seekers. Um, but yeah, I agree with you, you know, there, there's this, it's funny how there's this other group that people just kind of rallied against right away, right, so. Yeah, thanks for letting me just say that. Um, it's, it's sitting heavy on my spirit. <laughs> okay, okay, great, okay, thanks. Um, any, anything else? Any other reports, Susan? Um, no, there, well, there's a, <laughs> speaking of all that, so our other uh, safe haven on East Broadway, um, one of the people that rallied against it all is now suing to stop that one, but I don't think, I don't think there is a chance 
in hell that there'll be any success. All the contracts are signed, the work is in progress. Um, I expect them to open in a couple of months probably, um, but just sort of FYI, that lawsuit exists. Um, the fact that we did a um, resolution um, sort of, uh, uh, I forget, you know, I'm, I'm getting tongue tied, but we appreciated their programming and said their programming would be a benefit to the community. I sent that to them for their lawyers to use as part of proof of how they're benefiting the community. So I think it was, you know, some people wondered why we did that. I think it's proof of why it was important to do that. Okay, good. All right. Okay, so um, if okay, we don't have any other tabs or reports or CECs, I think we can wrap up the meeting. So we will start that with the final roll call. Okay, everyone. May Lee? Yes. Here. Thomas is here, present. Larissa? Present. Anna? Anna Calderon? Eric Diaz? Yes. Okay. Larry Fenn? Yes. Shirley Fennessy? Shirley? Um, Deborah? Present. Thank you. Alicia Lewis Coleman? No, Alicia. Heidi? Is Heidi with us? Present. Thank you. Arnett? Yeah, I'm, I'm present. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm present too. Did you say Arnette? I have Arnie. I mean, I have Arnette and I have Heidi. Okay. The three All right. voices are in. Okay. Thank you. Rodney? Yeah. Thank you so much. And Carmen? Present. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And that adjourns the meeting. And we will see you at the next meeting. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.